Okay, so I have to respond to a video Caitlin recently posted, mostly because she makes it too easy. I've been diving into the Russia-Ukraine conflict, have been listening to the various subject matter experts, and have noticed a pattern. The Putin apologist types like Aaron Maté build their narrative, by selectively quoting respectable people like Dr. Mersheimer and Dr. Cohen. From what I can tell, neither of these two would sign off on the ridiculous narrative that Maté constructs, which is why Maté has to resort to cherry-picking. From there, Maté selectively quotes other people here and there. Usually, when you click the link in his article you see that the article makes the opposite argument he was implying. I'll probably dive into that another day. But back to Caitlin. What I've noticed is that Caitlin pretty much takes Ma Tay's narrative and builds articulate, but demonstrably false articles around it, which at the end of the day, almost feel like an excuse to throw around words like empire and proxy war. Admittedly, I'm a bit fascinated, because Caitlin really seems to believe she's red-pilling us all, sharing information from, what she calls, the edge of the narrative matrix. In any case, let's get to the meat of her video. We'll skip past the long introduction, and get to the point where she begins making salient claims. And the status quo proxy warfare approach isn't stopping Russia as more and more territory is taken in the east in cool defiance of Western claims that Ukraine is bravely vanquishing the evil invaders. Biden administration officials have told the press that they doubt Ukraine will even be able to reclaim the territory it has lost already. Unless and until something significant changes, Ukraine has no apparent path to victory in this war anytime soon. In short, there is no exit strategy to this proxy war. There are no plans in place to deliver Putin a swift defeat, and the Biden administration remains steadfastly dismissive of even the slightest gestures toward dis diplomacy with Moscow. Okay, so Caitlin refers to this conflict as a proxy war over and over and over again. Given the actual definition of the term, she has not sufficiently supported her assertion. I've clicked on the links in her Substack articles and have heard the arguments made elsewhere. Everything I've seen is a stretch and requires some mental gymnastics to quote-unquote connect the dots. As for the progression of the war, let's take a look at the facts. Russia has already lost far more soldiers than the United States did in both Iraq and Afghanistan combined. They are already increasing the age of conscripts. It's unlikely that Russia can sustain this level of military action for much longer. And if you pay attention to their territorial gains, they've been pretty minimal and have been pushed back on occasions. For the number of losses they're taking, their progress has been limited. Meanwhile, Ukraine is receiving more and better weapons from NATO countries. As for something potentially changing to affect the war, this could very well happen. We might be on the edge of a recession, a recession that will reduce oil prices and gut Russia's source of revenue. This would all result in far more favorable negotiating terms for Ukraine, the country under invasion. I don't know that this would count as a swift defeat, but it's odd that Caitlin would even imply wanting a swift defeat, because NATO could very well deliver by entering the war. But of course, this would mean an unacceptable escalation towards World War III, which Caitlin already seems to think is underway given the current level of conflict. As we hydroplane toward the brink of nuclear Armageddon, while Bono and The Edge play U2 songs in Kyiv. In other words, there is a delicate balance to maintain. The idea is to help Ukraine defend itself, while still respecting the fact that Putin has nukes. Caitlin understands this, because she admonishes us bloodthirsty warmongers in her videos. People say things like, Putin believes he can rely on the nuclear threat to keep us from confronting him. Yeah, that's how military strategy works, dipshit. He has a military strength that his enemies need to respect. That means you shouldn't attack Russia, not that you should. For years I've had idiot QAnon cultists telling me nuclear weapons are a hoax and they're not real. Now all of a sudden my online notifications are full of shit libs saying almost the same thing. Boris Johnson has reportedly been buzzing around admonishing Ukraine's President Zelensky, France's President Macron, and who knows who else, not to work toward peace in Ukraine. The road to ending this war quickly by either winning it or negotiating a peace settlement have both been bolted shut, all but guaranteeing a long and bloody slog. Which, as it turns out, suits Washington just fine. Biden administration officials have stated that the goal is to use the Ukraine war to weaken Russia, and the U.S. already has an established pattern of working to draw Moscow into costly military quagmires, as we saw in both Afghanistan and Syria. 
continuing to pour weapons and military intelligence into Ukraine while working to cut Russia off from the world stands no chance of ending the war in a timely manner, but it does stand a pretty good chance of bleeding and weakening Moscow. And since is, this is the course of action that has been taken by the Empire, we can only assume that this is its desired outcome, not victory, not peace, but a long and grueling war. Isn't it amazing how the only actors with any agency in this scenario are people like Boris Johnson and Joe Biden? It's not that Vladimir Putin could end this all by withdrawing his troops and returning annexed territories. It was all part of the master plan all along, and the grandmasters continue to play their flawless chess game. Having written a book on astrology, maybe Kaelton really does believe that all of this disjointed dot connecting does amount to a coherent narrative. But let's take the Occam's razor approach. Maybe Putin just decided to do all of this, because he was always going to do this, either because of delusions of grandeur, out of genuine regard for Russia's long-term security prospects, or both. Here's the thing, we know Putin sees himself as a sort of Peter the Great. We also know Russia's changing demographics means that in the future, it won't be the military power it currently is, and so from a strategic standpoint, it makes sense for them to push west and plug certain entry points that have been used to invade Russian territory since time immemorial. Он когда заложил новую столицу, ни одна из, из стран Европы не признавала эту территорию за Россией. Все признавали ее за Швецией. А, а там испокон веков наряду с финно-угорскими народами, народами жили славяне. Причем эта территория находилась под контролем российского государства. Russians are the flavor of the month. They're being a little persnickety. Let's talk about why. They're dying out too. Two particular problems are on the short-term forecast for the Russians. First things first, here's your draftable age at age 18 to 20. In five years, the number of potential draftees will drop by half. The Red Army with half the size it has is not a military threat to most of the countries that are around it. So if the Russians are going to use military force to achieve what they want, they have to do it now. Second, the average age of male mortality is 59. The Russian technical educational system collapsed back in 1989, which means that the youngest cadre of Russian engineers who have the full suite of technical training are now in their 50s. In five years, they're going to start dying in mass, and the Russians won't be able to maintain their infrastructure, their missile forces, their army, their electricity system. So if they're going to move, they have to move now. And here's where they're moving. This is Eurasia on its side, north at the top, or north on the right side. The green area, if you have to live in Russia, that's where you want to live. It's not too cold. I mean, it's still cold. But uh, you can live here. You can grow food here. This is the part of Russia that's worth having. You'll notice, however, there are these big gaps on the periphery before you get to any sort of reasonable geographic barrier. The red zones are places you can hunker behind, mountains, deserts, seas. What the Russians have always tried to do is to expand to that outer shell and then plug the access points, these gaps. Now, the Mongols like these two in particular, the Persians the next two, the Turks invaded multiple times through the next two, the Germans, of course, have never met a square, square foot of Poland they didn't enjoy marching across, Sweden invaded Russia through the Balts twice, and here, everyone with a boat has invaded Russia here. Canada, yes, yes Canada has invaded Russia through the White Sea. If, with this degrading demography, the Russians can reach that shell and concentrate their forces in those gaps, they're going to last a lot longer. Otherwise, they're going to be trapped in this wide open area where potential foes can get at them militarily, culturally, economically, you name it, from a number of access points. During the Soviet period, the Russians controlled all nine of these gaps. At the end of the Soviet period, they dropped from nine to two. With the seizure of Crimea earlier this year, they went to three. Six to go. Five of those gaps are in the West. And for the Russians to get those gaps, they don't have to just take over Ukraine. They also need to take over Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, half of Poland, half of Romania, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Georgia. I'm going to guess that there are a few people in this room who know where those places are, because this is a not a normal audience for me. How that will happen? There's a lot of ways it can go down. The Russians have all the tools here. And until the Germans are willing to dedicate troops to protect the Polish frontier, and just saying that out loud blows my mind, 
Uh, the Russians do not see any meaningful resistance. The sanctions don't hurt them in a way that would make them reconsider. Remember, this is a country that is convinced that it's its last generation. It's going to take a lot to get their attention. And financial sanctions won't cut it.